Okay, so for our last session of the day, uh, we'll dive into the administration's customer executive order uh, and how organizations can work to meet those goals outlined in the order by using process automation and analytics, enhancing enterprise software delivery with low code development and revolutionizing the citizen experience. Please join me in welcoming our moderator, Jonathan Album, Federal Technology Officer at ServiceNow, Robert Brown, Chief Technology Officer for the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, Barbara Morton, Deputy Chief Veterans Experience Officer at the VA, and PV, Chief Executive Officer at Net Impact Strategies. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thanks, Neil. All right, hey, do you need this? All right, go get them. Did you get your entire team to be in line? <laughs> <laughs> Nice. <laughs> <laughs> wow. the VHS. <laughs> I'm going to get a lot of heckles. All right. Well, um, welcome everybody to our presentation on accelerating service delivery. I think this is a great conversation to have to conclude our day at um, our Fed Forum. We've had such a great experience <clears throat> being back in person and having these kinds of conversations about uh, mission resiliency, about the future of work, digital acceleration. We're bringing it all together in this final conversation as we focus on this idea of great customer experiences. So I'm really excited to have the, our panel. Um, and you know, we, we've been talking about the future of work and hybrid, and this is kind of our first hybrid panel. With, our, um, with one of our panelists, Barbara Morton, uh, remotely. So we're going to see how the technology works. And I'm completely optimistic that it's going to be fantastic and it's going to work great. So um, I want to go ahead and have our panelists give a, a brief introduction and explain uh, their roles in their organizations and some of the things that they've been doing around customer experience. So we're going to start with, with Barbara. So welcome, Barbara. Hello, everybody. It's, it's great to be with you all, although I'm, I'm missing a party, clearly, with all the uh, hoots and hollers from the crowd, So, but happy to be with you virtually. Um, so Barbara Morton, I am VA's Deputy Chief Veterans Experience Officer. My responsibility entails hardwiring, customer experience, uh, best practices, service design and delivery across the organization uh, for better outcomes and impact and access for veterans, their families, caregivers, and survivors. And super honored to be with you all today. Thank you, Barbara. Rob. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. I uh, yeah. appreciate it. Uh, at uh, DHS USCIS, um, I kind of I feel like I'm the chief nerd a little bit, um, or sometimes the low nerd, mm -hmm. depending upon what we're talking about. Uh, it's from stitching together at CXUX to uh, turning some screws um, and actually doing some integration and connecting data. So trying to be a part of all of it, and as well as like not just theorizing, but also actually doing some development. Making it practical. And, Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, last but not least, PV. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I'm CEO of Net Impact Strategies. A shout out to our team in Orange there. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are a managed strategy management consulting and software company. We're building solutions that are repeatable, reusable for agencies as product of a product strategy, services strategy. As a matter of fact, by the end of this month, we'll be the largest federal independent software vendor, but we want to solve the customer experience problems one time for the agencies to be able to leverage very quickly. So excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, we're, we're, uh, we're, we are excited to have all of you here uh, for this conversation. I just got to say, when I, when I saw that this was the last uh, presentation of the day, I was wondering, would there be anybody here? The fact that there's so many people here, and Rob brought a cheering section. PV brought uh, people in jackets. I mean, I, my, my, day is, uh, my day is made. But um, we're going to start with Barbara. Um, Barbara, you know, at the VA, there's so many different kinds of services, from delivery of care, benefits, um, a a cemeteries. There is a tremendous database on our veterans. So to make all of this work and to provide great customer experience, I know you've taken a human-centered design approach. And I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that and maybe describe some of the results that you've gotten from this kind of approach to doing your customer experience work. 
Yeah, absolutely. So I always like to sort of start a little bit from the beginning of our journey here in the Veterans Experience Office. And as some of you may know, our office um, was stood up as a sort of a response to what I call a catalyst. It really was sort of a crisis um, back in 2014, where veterans were waiting um, long uh, periods of time for their health care at the Phoenix uh, VA Medical Center. And that was really sort of a wake up call for us, I think, in VA to sort of think differently about how we deliver services, um, you know, particularly starting uh, with healthcare. And so what we did is after the office was stood up, we knew we wanted to sort of test and prove the concept of what a great experience, particularly in the patient space, would look like. And so of course we started with human-centered design and our our first ever um, sort of business line journey map exploring what is the patient experience with, with VA from scheduling an appointment to arriving to consultation and sort of next steps. And so we interviewed hundreds of veterans from across the country, different ages, demographics, locations, and really captured uh, moments that mattered most to them and thought to ourselves, okay, how might we operationalize changes based on moments that matter? And I'd love to give a quick, very low tech example of that. So one of the, the moments that mattered that we found from our HDD research in the healthcare experience journey was ease of navigation of a medical center. And the thing that I find fascinating about that is that ease of navigation probably would never naturally appear on a medical center director's operational dashboard, right? There probably would be a number of appointments scheduled, number of surgeries conducted, et cetera. And so the power for us of experience was to be able to elevate this moment that mattered to patients about navigating a VA medical center. So we worked with the Veterans Health Administration, early adopter um, of this movement, really, of patient experience and building this capability. And some medical centers had already established um, sort of an ambassador greeter program. So what we did is we worked with them to brand it. It's called the Red Coat Ambassador Program, and then scale it across the system. So veterans would have that consistent experience of a warm welcome and a a greeter in a branded, uh, identifiable sort of uh, coat to help them navigate the facility. And so we didn't stop there. You asked about impact. We wanted to understand what is the impact of actually operationalizing insights into action. And so with our our customer experience, patient experience surveys, we've added a question regarding ease of navigation. And since our first launch of this at scale, the agreement with ease of navigation has increased by four percentage points. So again, very evidence-based when you respond to the customer you always, every time, will produce better results for them. And and that just instantly sets them up for a positive experience during that moment that matters, which is a a great term. And I think one that's really essential to the... um, to the president's executive order on customer experience. You know, the, the EO yep. Yep. Um, on CX states that, you know, we have to use technology to modernize the government, implement services that are simple to use and accessible. I want to turn to Rob. And, um, you know, we note that, you know, the, the CX is a part of the PMA. We heard about it this morning during, um, during the keynote. So, you know, can you talk a little bit um, about the way you're implementing CX at USCIS? Sure. I guess, you know, there's the basic blocking and tackling as it relates to just general software delivery, what we're doing today. I feel, you know, we're pretty fortunate enough to, at USCIS and DHS that we actually have a, a great skilled staff, um, people that are pretty motivated uh, and understand that this is important. Um, I would say that a lot of this has to do with the mission and it's a great mission. Um, yet we, we do have the basic blocking and tackling of, you know, what, what, how do we actually get CX, how do we get human or user-centered design into the actual development process? Mm-hmm. Um, that's first and foremost. Some of, the, some of the things that we've done to, to bolster this and provide and abate some of the rogueness that happens and at least make it front and center is um, to actually start to hire the right people and make sure that we have good classified position descriptions so that we can hire bodies with that talent into the, into the government. It's not just a security specialist or a, whatever, a 2210. These right. folks can now actually, you know, hold their head high, and we've got them classified appropriately. Um, and then there's some of the artifacts that come out of that. We've spent the last uh, probably two years developing, after a lot of research, um, a good design system based upon um, what already exists today, um, and actually tailored it for USAS. And hopefully, it's a model for the rest of DHS if we're lucky. Um, there's there's also other artifacts. You know, just doing a lot of uh, cross-pollination, building the COE amongst the community of of designers 
that are thinking about this day in and day out. And starting to also develop a good research base that the entire organization, as well as others within DHS or even within the, uh, the federal community can reuse based upon similar sort of mm -hmm. uh, experiences that we present and have with, with our customer base. And you know, you're meeting people during a very challenging time in their lives potentially. So you have these natural challenges as Barbara described too, you're seeking care, you're seeking um, you know, some kind of outcome through the immigration process. The last thing you need is a complicated technology system to have to interact with. So that empathy that you were both describing, I think is, is really important. And you know, PV, as we think broadly across government, um, you know, it, requirements come in all shapes and sizes. We have immigration, we have healthcare. I worked at USDA. Farmers and ranchers are very different. You know, every agency has these unique kinds of challenges. So, you know, what I want to ask you with, you know, your years of experience on technology, different companies, uh, what are the skill sets that you think agencies need to be able to implement these kinds of technologies and take these kinds of new approaches to serving their customers? That's really an interesting question. Um, I, I think part of what we're not leveraging is the power of the broader audience that has the mission experience within the agencies, mm -hmm. make the technology work for them. Right. Obviously, we need to have skill sets, um, technical skill sets like cloud, cyber, so on and so forth. What uh, Rob is describing is an, he set up an integrated uh, platform on which people can innovate on top of uh, to accelerate the delivery. So it is taking that business analyst or mission analyst that understand the context of mm -hmm. what we need to do to enable service delivery, acceleration, and yeah. teaching them it's no-code environment on top of this integrated platform. I think that's a big skill set that I think is Connecting people who understand the mission to people who understand technology and ideally helping people who understand the mission know technology, people who know technology know the mission. Now you have this exactly. uh, amazing intersection of people yeah. who can do really tremendous things. And, you know, uh, being able to see the mission in action, I always felt was very important. Right. You know, see a veteran, see a farmer, see, see the immigration process. And, um, you know, it doesn't take a technology skill set to do it. It takes, just takes the willingness that, Absolutely. you know, we heard about Absolutely. this morning. So we don't need to build our environment around big modernization all the time. Obviously, you need professional developers, you need full stack developers, you need cyber experts. But we can solve problems on top of a modern platform, mm -hmm. like a service now, and build uh, workflows, build process flows, and build modernization capabilities incrementally. And that's consistent with, I think, what Rob is doing right No, absolutely. I mean, it, you know, all of that undifferentiated heavy lifting is gone um, because it's already been taken care of. Now I just put the, the mission-oriented folks that have, you know, some technology skills and those skills are, can, as they enter in our workforce today, are continuing to rise as well as just curious minds. Uh, now we can actually enable them. And we're seeing that enablement um, in various formats. Plus, with the right standards and governance in place, mm -hmm. we're abating... You know, I, just, I was saying this earlier, we are abating the 1,500 random rogue applications that are being developed across the board without security in mind, without right. data standards in mind. So now with that right platform, with the right standards, with the right governance, the right easy pathway, um, we enable folks to abate essentially the old way of doing business. I don't need a DevSecOps team anymore I, at all. I don't need to have all of these other folks bolted in. Um, it's straight to, straight to the individual. Right. When, when you have those kinds of very complex environments, one, there's risk in there, uh, but you also, it's also emblematic of, I designed these systems based on what I need as the CIO or the government program manager. I didn't design it from the customer's perspective. It's very kind of inside of government out to the public approach. And what you're talking about is very outside in. You know, what does the veteran need? What does the farmer need? What is the, uh, what is the uh, person in the immigration process need and when you think about it that way, you can't abate all those systems. And, you know, just building on that, um, Barbara, uh, I've heard you express uh, in the past that veterans have had some consistent challenges navigating VA systems. And, you know, how would you, um, how would you say VA is doing about alleviating this and making it simpler for people, again, people in need, people who need something to get what they need simply and effectively? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I, I love this conversation because one of the things that we wanted to do early on was bring on in-house designers, um, human-centered design specialists when we first stood up this office back in 2015, 2016, and there were no PDs that were classified for, for that talent. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to where we are today. And to your point, we actually have our you know, VA's first ever chief design officer in our shop and a whole team of federal employees who are CX strategists and design specialists. What that does is it enables us to deeply understand the culture, to know how to navigate government and, and sort of infuse our decision making and our prioritization with the voice of the veteran and veteran needs. So, so to your question about navigation, that is a, a recurring pain point. And so I kind of gave a, a, gave a low tech example of how we've empowered our employees with tools through the Red Code Ambassador Program to actually deliver red experiences. A high tech example is VA.gov. And I love to tell this story because it really kind of shows our evolution, um, you know, using the customer voice to inform strategic decision making. So back in 2018 or so, we really kind of, want, as a department, wanted to tackle this head on. And at the time, we had lots of different web properties out there. We had VA.gov, we had Vets.gov, we had eBenefits, we had My Healthy Vet, lots of different properties. And we thought to ourselves, why don't we ask veterans if they wanted to have a single digital front door? which one of these brands or properties would they orient to? And they came back to us and they said, you know, VA.gov, it's a strong brand. That is where we would go if we don't know where to go to help us navigate VA. So that was the first time in my recollection that a secretary level, department level strategic decision was made to actually designate VA.gov as VA's front door digital entry, which is fantastic. But we didn't stop there, of course. We redesigned in the entire website. So what you would have seen, you know, pre-2018, was a very bureaucratic looking, and I say that with love in my heart always, but very bureaucratic looking website with announcements about the president's budget. Now, do we know that our customers care about that or don't care about that? Of course, they're not interested in that. They really want to get to business with VA. And so working in close partnership um, with our chief, tech chief technology officer and his team, we applied human-centered design to co-design and re-release, relaunch the website top transactions up front, integrated profile, login opportunity, really making it seamless for veterans to transact with us. And I'll just add one more comment too. Yeah, go sure. ahead, go ahead. Well, I do, what are the underlying technologies you use and how, how, what sort of process automations are, are, are in there? So we, so VEO, we sponsor a lot of the backend data systems integration. So that is enabling that sort of integrated profile on VA.gov. But really, this is sort of, you know, the, the brainchild and built and co-designed with veterans. And I was going to mention the mobile app, too. So VA's first ever mobile app has been in soft launch the last few months. And that is, again, real-time co-designed with veterans to kind of create a very easy way to transact with the department. So we are really seeping in this methodology deep, deep into the organization. And the results have, have sort of spoken for themselves. So the before and after we relaunched VA.gov, veteran satisfaction with use of the website increased by over 20%. So another great evidence-based use case for why design thinking. I think that's and, great that you have a metric you can yes, point to. Yes. And you can note exactly the kinds of improvements yes, your technology exactly. created, having that baseline, and, you know, being able to tell that, uh, that validating the value, you know, Absolutely. of the work is so yep. huge. And that creates more opportunities, I think, for, for additional kinds of uh, automations and other digital transformation activities. And, you know, PV, coming back, back to you, um, I, I'm wondering what kinds of examples of automation you've seen elsewhere in government. Um, we talk a lot about hyper automation at ServiceNow. We've talked about end-to-end um, -end digital workflows. You know, these things have a real value. I'm, I'm curious how you've so seen it deployed. In, in it's practice. really interesting. It's really interesting. If you read the executive order, it cites 9 billion hours spent filling paper. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a time tax, yeah, I time think, is one of the terms they yeah, use. Right. Um, so if you kind of think about digital technologies, digital interactions, that could be order of magnitude cut down. Right. So there are a lot of opportunities. I think we're handling big modernizations on benefits like veterans benefits or um, CIS benefits, but there are a lot of citizen interactions as well as within the government, I think with the workflows. So people are using uh, very successfully, uh, take a PDF type legacy, you know, not just process um, automation. It doesn't really help if you have taken a PDF and put it digital and run it like an analog process, right? Modernized, a modernized process. 
So that a uh, lot is happening um, within the mission with the mission workflow automation. Uh, for example, every agency uh, does some kind of case management. Mm -hmm. uh, you may not call it case management. So to be able to modernize, whether it's a benefits, veterans benefits, or a, a case as it's related to CIS or ICE, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot of, lot of opportunity that is opening up to free up the time you would have otherwise spent running that process to innovate more, to educate more of the business analysts I was talking getting about. Getting people back to the high uh, value high, tasks, high right? You know, right. moving off of the low value stuff right. that took time. And then right. a, a, there's a lot of stuff on the IT management side that we do as a mm -hmm. process that I think agencies are uh, modernizing and aut automating. Uh, for example, uh, just simple thing like asset auditing, Mm -hmm. that we do on assets that we issue, the government issues annually, you have to do that. It doesn't have to be, you know, we don't need to send field service reps to go scan and do that, give it, do it yourself kind of things to um, onboarding. I think um, employee onboarding right. is something that um, we don't necessarily do a good job. Even though we have systems, we still do emails Contract onboarding is a is a significant issue. Right, and contractor onboarding is a significant issue, issue from my experience. And you know, PB, I like the fact that you sort of transition from employee uh, to to employee experiences because you know we're talking about accelerating service delivery. From you know an agency's perspective, service delivery is uh, inclusive of those employee experiences in addition to the customer experiences we right. talked about. And you know, Rob, I'm curious from your perspective how. Um, you, you think about employee experience at USCIS. What kinds of things are you doing to make it easier for your colleagues um, to serve people going through the immigration process? Yeah, absolutely. Have the tools they need. We, we've, you know, a big push uh, for USCIS is backlog reduction. And how do we deal with backlog reduction? We've talked about automation. We've talked about um, CX for, the, for typically the, the public or non-public looking for X, a benefit. Um, but how do we deal with our own internal challenges? We've talked a little bit about, you know, how we get this PDF, now what do we do? So, uh, and we've got a large effort right now of just, we just pure digitization of warehouses uh, filled with paper. So intelligent document processing is very big. Um, and so what do you do? That's great to scan it and run OCR on it, run some NLP on it, throw it in a data lake and run some analytics, wonderful. How does that help my colleagues? How does it help the adjudicators so they can do their job faster or automate the nonsense or BS mm -hmm. that's actually in their job? So uh, taking that sort of that approach and if I can, like that's great to do all these wonderful things with, with that data and apply some machine learning and some AI, but how do I really make it useful for that adjudicator or for some risk and fraud officer? So taking an approach of doing sort of generative actual workflows using, using CX UX principles, and using generative research, but actually moving that to the beginning of the process as opposed to throughout or at the end. And then if I can apply the folks that actually I'm actually researching to then take that same skill set and apply it to those processes and to that technology, now I've just empowered them mm -hmm. to actually be front and center. And then what that means is I can do all of this pre-processing as an actual individual or customer um, is actually applying the benefit, meaning that, that backlog can then be reduced dramatically because yeah. I'm taking all that work right as far as I can to the left. Um, plenty of other areas to talk about well, as well. Well, I, I think what's interesting to me about what you said is, you know, it, it, the customer is um, all based on, you know, your perspective and where you sit. So CX, we say customer experience. Well, if you're serving employees of your agency, they are your customers. And applying these same principles, like you just said, creates an employee experience that's very different to what people have uh, experienced before. And the less complicated it is to do their job, the more engaged they are. Uh, I had an opportunity to meet with another agency's IT leadership team earlier, and we're talking about what it takes to onboard employees to serve those agencies' customers. And many of those agency employees leave after a short period of time because the systems don't support effective working. The systems are hard to use uh, and it takes long to learn them. So, you know, people want to work with technologies in their work life that are very similar to the technologies in their 
in their home life. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, right now, it's, it, there's plenty of experiences. Another big one for us is the developer experience. Uh -huh. And that can be applicable to an employee. How do we make sure that they, we talk about onboarding, some of our onboarding can take a month just for a developer to know where North is. Yeah. Uh, so that becomes really important just for general efficiencies. Yeah. So yeah, now, but if I may add to uh, the, the importance of the work Rob and the team has been doing as a former customer yeah. of a predecessor organization, INS, I can, I can tell you my, my customer experience. But recently, one of our family members applied for a green card and had the benefit of having transparency of the entire process. 30 plus years ago, when I applied for a green card, uh, must have been 15 and a half at the time, maybe young, young person. Uh, so there, there was no web. So you didn't know how to apply. So you went to a lawyer. Well, I couldn't afford a lawyer. And I said, I'll do it myself. I was in Philadelphia at the time. Go to INS office. Realize that, well, you can go to the office. You have to stand in the line at four o'clock, come back next day. I get a form. I asked that officer, what do I do next? And he said, well, we'll tell you. So it kind of felt like a spy thriller. What do I do next? Meet me at the Paris train station on platform number seven. We'll tell you what it is. And I had 14 visits that I had to make, that interaction, and it changes uh, over a period of three and a half years with this work is so meaningful for yeah. people it impacts. And you know, we have a long ways to go, but I really appreciate well, but, what you It makes a difference about how you feel about the government, you yeah, know, how you exactly. feel about your experience. And, it's one of the tenets of the executive order that we've been, we've been talking about today. If I can create great experiences for people interacting with the government, I can change the way they think about government and I can slowly build trust. And that's one of the most important things that I think we have the opportunity to do as IT leaders in, in the federal government. And Barbara, I can't help but see you nodding your head and smiling. I'm curious if you, there's a comment you, you want to make on this, on this topic. Well, I, I mean, absolutely. I mean, this this whole movement around customer experience, employee experience. I mean, this is this is a key recruitment tool, right? I mean, for this next generation of energized, creative, vibrant public servants, thinking about how to do government differently, and again, grounding us in why we're all here, which is for the people, not the bureaucracy first, for the people first. It's just it's it's so far reaching and so inspiring, and I just I'm so thrilled that to, we're all kind of part of this orbit together and, and creating um, this ecosystem that is actually really, really appealing for folks to step into in a totally different way. Now, um, we only have a few minutes left, uh, but Barbara, I was hoping you could help us uh, conclude our conversation with one or two best practices or some advice for the audience, people who are doing the same kind of work, where do they get started? Yep. What have you, what's a lesson learned that you wanna share? I mean, I think there are a couple of things. I mean, for us in VA, we've been very fortunate year over year, administration over administration to bridge the importance and urgency of customer experience and employee experience as well. So I think having the highest level of leadership support um, is, is critical. And thankfully, we have an incredible um, CXEO to help lead the way and guide the way, which is amazing. Um, the second thing I would say is always start with a journey map, whether it's a macro problem or a macro issue that you want to understand or as a very specific drill down, um, some part of a business line, always start with sort of orienting around human-centered design research and a journey map. And then the third thing I would say is we put together um, last year, the customer experience cookbook. And this is really sort of a, an opus for our brothers and sisters across agencies to really understand how they in their culture and their agency and their organization can use these mechanisms, ingredients, levers in government to build and mature a CX capability. Well, thank you, Barbara. Those are great advice. I really like the idea of doing that journey map, thinking about the, the workflow, how the data flows. If you don't know that for your processes or your agency, it's very hard to innovate. It's very hard to improve. And who knows if you're even improving something that is working, right? You know, so, so I think that's great advice, really sort of grounds, um, grounds your work and next steps. Uh, Rob, final, final thoughts, lessons learned? things you want to share? Yeah, I think first it's just understanding who your customers are, as we've already talked about. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that, and we haven't talked about it, but our business partners is also really important. Mm -hmm. It's great about the American public. We're here to serve and develop trust and give them the right data. It's also very important to you know, work with our business partners. Um, so ensuring you understand who they are, what they need, and addressing that can be you know, maybe just as important. Yeah. Um, 
Sorry. Well, I was going to say, note the customer experience executive order has a definition for customer and it's citizens, it's other agencies, yep. it's businesses, it's nonprofits, it's other governments. So you're, you're absolutely right. You know, think about who that customer is. And like we talked about before, sometimes the customer is your employee. Yeah, it could be my buddy sitting behind me. Yeah. So you got to have that expansive view of this seemingly simple word, right? So no, I, I, if I can, the other, and this is a little, if I can nerd out a little bit. Please, please, if you guys don't mind. A um, left. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'll be quick. Um, I, I think another, just from lessons learned, I think it's very important to actually do the research. And what's really important is workflows. And if you can actually bundle and catalog those workflows using that generative research framework, it'll save you a lot of time. Mm-hmm. A lot of time. And whatever you develop, even if it's an older antiquated way of developing or on a low-code, no-code platform. Thank you, Rob. PV, bring us home. So, I think it's um, pull it all together. I think doing a better change management across the, mm-hmm. the cultural change that is happening with the EO is that customer experience is important, delighting citizens, delighting internal customers. So do a, a better job of managing the change as a best practice and measuring that change using commercial uh, B2C kind of approaches like net promoter score, mm-hmm. where only delighting customers matter right. and not keeping them satisfied like passive doesn't really matter. I think that whole change spectrum, focusing on that just as much of well, the actual yeah. technology, I think is You important. know, sometimes that change management requires you to slow down a little bit, right? Yeah. If you go too fast, you can miss those, create some blind spots and miss things like that. So I think that, you know, we have some great ideas on how we can all move forward. As a, as a federal IT community, um, whether it's, it's journey mapping, whether it's thinking about change management or really identifying that, that customer. You're doing those things, I, I feel based on my experience, we're gonna get good results. And you know, those are the things that are needed if we're going to accelerate service delivery, if we're going to live up to the promises that we talked about today um, as, a, as a federal community and provide services to the people that need them. And you know, with that, I want to I want to conclude and just say thank you to Rob, the PV, and and Barbara. I am so glad the technology worked. Thank you. I'm glad thank you were you. able to be here and I'll turn things back over to Steve Walters. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.